Good afternoon. I'm Chauncey Williams, and this is the face of your financial future, personal finance, volume one, two, and three. We're going to start off with volume one. The website is what do I do now.biz, and it's based on a book and a concept that when the mortgage meltdown came in 2006, 2007, and rolled out to about 2008, I was affected by that. So the whole picture of me with the money in the background. It's not something to brag. It's not something to boast. It's saying that I had to figure out what the face of my money looked like in the future because you can't get anything unless you sow a seed for your future. So this, this is about what do you do to get yourself on track? Several years ago, I wrote a book called What Do I Do Now? So I said, let me make this online course to give everybody a, a resource and a tool that's not an actual textbook that's tangible, but an actual resource they can log in and they can get access to materials like this. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go through this lesson. It's broken down in a PowerPoint for you so my audience can be successful and we can reach out and give you the resources you need to make sure your financial future is on the right track. So come on and join me. Mission statement, to provide our students with an opportunity through education to acquire the knowledge, the economic knowledge, skills, and the resources to step substantially improve their financial status. And that's me, Chauncey Williams. That's me with the book in my hand and saying we're going to translate this book into a whole PowerPoint so that people can understand that they can change their financial future. Next slide. Now, this is an introduction. Now, this is actually two clients I had previously in the past, and I want to share their situations with you. One is a female, Sandra, a 25-year-old single mother, and she has, and she's a teacher. And one day she's preparing dinner, and her son answers the phone. And when the phone rings, Sandra picks up at the four rings with hesitation. The call on the other end of the um, asks these following questions. May I speak to Sandra Williams? Chandra replies, she is not available. May I take a message? Obviously, she was frustrated with the caller replies. Well, do you know when you expect her to come? Well, Chandra was blushing, states, I am sorry, I do not. Can I take a message? And for the 15th time of the day, the caller says, this is blank bank. And I believe she has our number. So Chandra hangs up the phone as her son asks her, his mother, why did you lie, mom? Who was that? Nobody. No one. No one. Uh, the next concept is bury your head in the sand. Marcus is a car salesman who earned $75,000 last year, leased a new Cadillac, and is now living in a luxury apartment. This year, it seemed as if business was a little slower and his income was a bit less. Although he had managed to pay his rent and his lease payment most months, they were rarely on time. As for all the other bills, that was just a different story. Marcus avoided opening his email and mail and kept an ever increasing pile of mail in a drawer in his desk. He had literally fallen $30,000 in debt in less than three years as practically every bill and past due notice he received in the last year was in that drawer. Marcus lived on the premise that if he ignored the debt, it would magically disappear. Now I'm not saying that is you, I'm not saying that's me, but these are situations and scenarios I ran into with actual clients that have a certain way of thinking that keeps them locked in a paradigm. <clears throat> and here's another example. Ant, a, a skilled tradesman, a welder, receives a paycheck every two weeks. It is payday in three days, and Ant needs money for gas and snacks right now. He has no cash on him, but decides to use his debit card for gas and snacks, knowing that the money will not be in his account until the direct deposit hits Friday. The problem is that he will have an overdraft fees of $34 a day for two days. Consequently, there is always more days than money in Ant's bank account. Now, let me ask you this question. Do any of these situations sound familiar to you? They do for many Americans, as they are common symptoms or warning signs that millions of people are dealing with as a result of problems with debt. This is a very common problem and unfortunately very easy to fall into. In this volume, volume one, we will take a closer look at credit, debt, and common problems that can happen as a result of overspending and accumulating excessive debt, 
we will also begin to look at effective steps to take when beginning to climb out of debt. And this is my example of the paradigm I was talking earlier, the mindset that people have. So look here, we have this self-esteem. People have self-esteem, right? We see that. Self-esteem, the belief in yourself, your, um, your affirmations, how you are affirming thoughts you have about yourself. But then we have, over time, we evolve. Things happen. Life happens. Through growth and development, we are able to capture ourselves in scenarios and situations and life experience to put us in certain situations. Now, our self-esteem can be directly connected to you, credit, and debt. So that credit score can say a lot about a person, kind of like a grade of a student. And I share this concept with all three volumes because I really, truly believe in it. So from age 18 to 21 to 22 plus, you're going to be introduced to credit. So as you introduce this concept of credit, self-esteem, growth over time, and this credit score, what's to come? Now, you can view yourself in a negative way or a positive way. But it all goes into how we think, act, choices, and how we feel about ourselves. But dealing with debt, debt is a deficit. It's something that can keep you down. So I call that pain, the debt, uh, the pity pot, the deficit that you're in, especially if your credit score is below 700 or a subprime credit score like 400, 500, 600. Uh, it keeps you in a cycle of, um, of anger. When you're thinking, feeling, and acting in pain, you're angry and you have an attitude. So a lot of things are suppressed thoughts, depression. You get you worried about the bills or a bill collector calling you or having a strange knock or a note on your door. Insanity. That's the cycle of thinking that, okay, if I, like the guy I mentioned earlier, the, the car salesman, if I put the bills in the drawer, they will, the problems will magically disappear. Some people do that over and over and over again, and pretty soon they got notices and collections and garnishments coming. And that, to me, that adds up to nonsense because one plus one is not 15. One plus one is not zero. So you got to think about what are you doing to make sure you change this negative thinking, feeling, and acting because it's all the choices that we're making that's directly connected to our self-esteem that can affect our credit and debt over time as we grow as people. Uh, as we go on, you have change. Now, that's a, a good way to see yourself uh, from your self-esteem of having a higher power of affirming who you are. The change can come in a form of courage that you say, okay, I, I believe I can do something with my situation now. Uh, being honest, our credit is bad. <laughs> I need to do some things differently instead of just buying everything I see and going out to eat all the time. I might need to use this word right here, budget. Uh, the anger and the attitude, it changes to a positive attitude. You, you become not frustrated, but you become, you get this mental fortitude and you build this appetite for having credit and savings instead of debt and bills. Uh, Excuse me. You start networking with the right kind of people. You start knowing your banker. You start hanging around people that that save money, that coupon. Uh, you start having gratitude. You start being thankful for the things you have, and you start looking at your bank account and say, "Hey, I'm not overdrafted anymore." So that affects your self esteem and your belief in yourself. And over time, we can change this. And the last thing is endurance. You keep on doing this process. If you get paid every week, every two weeks and you're looking at those multiple accounts, you're paying bills off, and you're going towards good choices. And that gets us to the point of debt in volume one. Look at this guy. He's carrying the burden of his debts on his back in volume one. What is debt? It's a question for you. What is it? Debt is something owed to another or the condition of owing to be in debt generally we can define a debt as a noun as it is a form of money in fact debt is money but it is money owed it is a liability that an individual is responsible for therefore it reduces your net worth or your total money so a lot of times people praise so i got that new car 
or I bought a house, or I got this new phone. My thing is I always look at what I got coming in and what I have coming out. I always try to lower the amount that I have coming out. And I know we need the essential things, food, shelter, shelter, and clothing is not essential to me, but transportation is. And a car that can give me the A to B that's paid off and I don't have a note on it, it's worth, 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 worth much more than something brand new that I'm only going to drive probably an hour a day. So we got to think about those things when we're thinking about debt reduction in this educational course. Assets, liabilities, equal access, takeaway liabilities equals net worth. So basically, when an individual wants to purchase goods or services but does not have the money, he or she will borrow it from a bank or a financial institution and agree to repay the loan with a specified fixed or flexible time schedule. Generally, we borrow from a bank or a financial institution, but we also borrow directly from the merchant who is selling the product. Most likely, we are obligated to pay back more than we have borrowed and pay interest as a fee for using their money. Hear that word again? Their money, not yours. Other times, we borrow from friends and family and usually are not asked to pay any interest. Throughout this course, we will be using familiar terms in describing the principles of debt reduction. To have a full understanding, we will take a few moments to define some important terms so that we can ensure that we all have a crystal clear understanding of the language in this course. So as you can see, these are basic vocabulary words you have when you're dealing with financial literacy. The first thing is principal, a capital sum placed at interest, due as debt, or used as a fund, the amount of money that is borrowed. Interest or finance charge, the percentage of the financial principal on an annual basis that is paid for the use of money borrowed from another. Interest is the fee a person is charged for using another's money. Credit, an amount of money placed at a person's disposal by a bank, something entrusted to another on loan. An amount of money made available for your control by a bank or a retail merchant. Revolving credit, access to continuous fixed credit line as an individual makes or begins to, to make payments on credit use. That amount is then available to reuse. Most credit cards are allowed the user revolving access to set credit limits. Credit card, an authorized card authorizing purchases on credit. These cards allow you to borrow up to a set limit or your credit limit. Conditions for repayment are flexible, allowing the borrower to pay back at their own pace. Only a minimum amount is due every month. Charge card. Like a credit card, a charge card allows a user to make purchases on credit. Generally, all purchases made during specified times need to be paid in full within 30 days. Loans, money lent with interest, collateral, an X asset, something of resellable or immediate cash value used as a guarantee against a loan. Debt, something owed to another using credit in the condition of owing debt may be used interchangeably at times. Secured debt, continuing with the vocabulary, loans that are backed or guaranteed by property or assets that you own. Secured debt loans are for automobiles, homes, boats, and other real property. When the borrower is unable to make the loan payments, the property can be repossessed or foreclosed. Now, if you've been living in this world long enough, you either been repossessed or foreclosed or you know somebody that has. Many banks will allow you to borrow money using a savings account as collateral against the loan. Unsecured debt, loans that don't require any assets to guarantee or back them. These loans are given to individuals who present a good credit risk and promise full faith and credit to pay back the loans as agreed. Now we have a better understanding of some very common financial terms. Let's take a closer look at two very powerful words, credit and debt, positive and negative. I think that's how I think when I think of those two words. Now, let's look at this. Now that we have all the better understanding of a very common financial terms, let's take a closer look into credit and debt. 
Give an example for each word defined. I would like for you to do this lesson. So you give an example of each one. You can have, you can use Google, you can uh, use a dictionary, but giving it, so going straight to number 12. So you got the ones I just went over and you give me an example of them because when you can use an example, that's called using applicable skills. You can apply the skills that you learned in class to this actual assignment. So number 12 says, give an example of when you may have overspent or accumulated excessive debt. How did this change your lifestyle? Did you fall behind on bills or write checks you did not have for money? Now that we have a better understanding of some very common financial terms, let's take a closer look at the very powerful words credit and debt. Lesson number two, credit and debt. In this lesson, we will examine some of the functions of debt in our economy. We will also look at some right and wrong reasons for using credit in your everyday life. Finally, we will describe the purpose that credit serves in today's economy. Let's look at some of the most common reasons why people get into debt. Or said another way, let's look at the reasons that consumers are using credit far more often today than ever before. When people need to buy something and do not have the money, they borrow or finance the purchase today and plan on paying for it tomorrow. Using credit, consumers are able to purchase, make purchases when they don't have the cash or when they don't want to pay for the entire purchase at one time. This can be extremely beneficial to consumers as it allows us to make purchases and pay for them as a part of our So this is what this was once only available to wealthy people. Now access to credit line is readily available to most Americans. In fact, a large majority of American adult population have credit cards. Additionally, almost everyone purchases an automobile using some form of credit at some point in their lives. As consumers, we take we could take advantage of credit to make almost any purchase. Practically every retail outfit in the world will honor a visa and MasterCard. For those who don't, a private charge card is likely to be available. Now, here's the thought of the day. I want you to do this because I just ran into a client that I was working with, and this word I dislike, inquiry. When I see them on people's credit reports, it hurts my feelings. Inquiries. Because an inquiry means you apply for credit, and here's the thought of the day to help you understand what that means. Next time you're in a supermarket, department store, or gas station, Count the number of people who pay for their purchases with cash or credit cards. Many people would be surprised to learn that the majority of retail purchases are made with credit cards. This is, this is in complete contrast to how many parents handle business in the 60s and 70s. My parents. Not surprising, credit card companies are soliciting, soliciting I mean, asking to um, younger adolescents as high school and junior college websites Emails are filled with credit card offers to teenagers who may not never held, even have a job. Establishing credit has become easier than ever before, and consumers are credit are using credit to make purchases ever than ever before. Why has credit become so easy to obtain? Having credit available to make purchases allows consumers to purchase impulsively. I'm sure you have noticed. The banners and signs in department stores that offer the shopper access to instant credit. Instant credit allows consumers to make purchases immediately without the thinking or contemplating that they that may have taken place if one needed to save up for it or deplete their checking account or make the same purchases. This allows the consumer to take advantage of discounts for any purchases that made that day. Consequently, this leads to higher revenues for manufacturers and for retail department stores. In addition to the profit that a company will make by selling a product, offering financing can be an additional source of revenue for the department store, bank, or credit card company. For example, if a consumer wants to purchase a new computer retailing at $2,000, they may have two choices. And here they are. Choice one, assuming the consumer has the money, he or she can pay the total price of 
Number two, the consumer does not have the money and elects to purchase the, cus the computer using his or her credit card with a 19, I said 19 percent interest, assuming that the, con the customer makes a monthly payment of 2 percent per month. That's that minimum. Roughly $43, it will take him or her seven years to pay off a debt at a total of $3,612. Factoring any additional fees or late charges and the cost of computer could, could would substantially increase. When the computer would is when the computer is finally paid for, it will probably be obsolete. That means it'd be somebody would be saying, I paid three thousand dollars for this computer and it'd be ten years old. <laughs> but they probably just paid it off a year ago. So it won't even be worth anything. The credit card company will make at least $1,600 from a $2,000 investment. Oh, but wait, the credit card company makes money on both sides of the deal. The credit card company reimburses the merchant only 95 to 97% of the original purchase price. The merchant is also charged a fee for accepting the payment in the form of a credit card. From the pre preceding example, the credit card company would pay the department store between 1900 and 1940 of your $2,000 purchase, $2,000 purchase. As you can see, extending credit to consumers can generate healthy profits for the lenders, manufacturers, and merchants. It's a win-win-win situation. The consumer is able to purchase and use a computer. The merchant makes a profit from the sale of the computer. The manufacturer makes a profit from the sale of the computer. And the lender makes a profit from the finance charge. But they make way more money than you paid out. So the original cost was two thousand dollars, and you probably pay for it. You'll pay for it twice when you're done. So again, so credit can be good for the economy. That's a question now. When consumers are spending money, they are also creating jobs. When an individual purchases a computer, jobs are created as workers are needed to needed the engineer design manufacturer transport sale and repair that computer additionally factories need to be built which creates jobs for construction workers architects and laborers these additional jobs create more income which allow which allows more money to be pumped into the economy so when the credit is extended to consumers it gives a boost to the economy which in turn benefits all of that economy for these and many other reasons it's not hard to understand how using credit can be powerful to, for today's consumers. If credit is so wonderful, why am I in so much trouble? Now, I, I just uh, think about this because it's in my book also. It just makes me laugh because some people just have that mindset. and I'm going to read this, but they feel like, oh, I got good credit. I got this. Imagine if you got good money. If you saved up, you wouldn't even need credit. You can use credit to pay you. As we have seen, access to credit can be an incredible tool in an individual's financial arsenal. However, it can also be a source of significant grief for those who abuse it and become overextended. Some individuals establish excellent credit ratings and use credit to their advantage when needed. Others, however, begin using credit and quickly realize that their debt becomes out of control as they spiral deeper and deeper in uncontrollable spending and debt. In these upcoming sections, we will attempt to explain the causes of uncontrollable debt. But first, let's take a look at the different types of debt. As we will demonstrate, there are three different kinds of debting. I said debting. Good reasons, sensible reasons, and problematic reasons for using credit or for getting into debt. Good reasons for using credit. I got your car, I got your house. That go my, it's not actually mine, but it's a Michigan State diploma because I'm a Michigan State Spartan. When making large purchases, such as buying a home, a car, or financing education, the cost is so substantial that saving in advance would be often difficult, if not possible. For example, purchasing a reliable used automobile can cost as much as $8,000 to $10,000. If car loans were not available, a person might have to save for two to three years to pay for this vehicle. However, getting to and from a job can be quite challenging if you don't have transportation. 
Taking out a loan to purchase a vehicle would allow the borrower to utilize their vehicle to make money. For example, getting to and from work. The same type of principle applies when purchasing a home. If a family was required to save the entire cost of a home prior to purchasing one, they might be forced to save over 15 to 20 years before they have enough money to pay cash for a home. When they are finally are able to afford the home, the children may be grown and, and living in another state. In that case, the huge four bedroom house would no longer be necessary. Financing a college education is another practical or good reason for going into debt. Going to college for four years to obtain a bachelor's degree can often cost between thirty and eighty thousand. If you were unable to acquire a loan to finance his or her education, a student was, he or she may be saving for a very long time without the benefit of a larger income that a higher education can provide. Now, I know I wrote this material and I've given it to you, but I want to say this. If you if you if you live in a smaller city, and your commute to work is only 20 minutes, do you need a brand new car? Are, is, are there special programs out there for you to get a home where they give you down payment assistance? Or you can look for a home at, at an auction and try to save up at least half if it's a home that's worth so much that you can get a starter home? Or what about going to community college first or going to or being certified in high school and getting some form of education to help you get there where you don't have to take out so many loans. So it's always an alternative, but sometimes people want the bright, shiny stuff and the big name school. So you gotta be careful when you're preparing for your future, you're driving or you're looking for somewhere to stay. Now this is an exercise, exercise 2.1, financial tip. Anytime going into debt will allow you to make money for yourself or allow you to make a purchase that increase in value or at a substantially discounted price, then using credit to make the purchase is likely a good reason. Can you give two other examples of using credit? Two, I got three, but if you could just give me two. Other examples using credit. Sensible reasons for using credit. At times, we as individuals like to take advantage of the opportunity to play now and pay later. This may mean taking out a loan for such needed vacation or purchasing a new TV because the reception on your old set is deteriorating. Provided that you don't carry any substantial debt and that you will have no problems meeting your expenses and bills with additional debt. It may be reasonable to assume additional debt. And that stuff happens to me. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'll see stuff that I want. Then I'll think about a credit card balance I got. I say, if I'm going to buy this, because it just came up. I was, I was going to buy a jacket that cost $200. I got a credit card balance that I got to pay down that has already paid down half. And I'll say, well, I'm going to put that $200 with that jacket I wanted on this credit card. So when I get the balance down to zero, I could just buy the jacket. I don't have to finance a jacket. So think about that. Bad or problematic debt. Going into debt can be easily can, can can become easily problematic. If we fail to understand its purpose or when we begin to misuse it, generally individuals who misuse credit use it as an extension to their regular paychecks. These individuals are using credit as extra spending money and are not considering the consequences of their spending. Often people will purchase $500 to $1,000 using credit cards while making only the minimum $20 a month payment to that particular credit card. They quickly reach their credit limit and realize that their spending habits must change. However, because they have enjoyed their newly acquired spending habit and making the minimum payments on both credit cards, again, they quickly reach the credit limit on their new credit card and repeat the process. Credit card companies may automatically increase your limit if you are making your minimum payments on time. When asked about their spending over the past month, these problematic debtors can only account for probably, I say, half of their spending. Most of the purchases were for unnecessary leisure or recreational expenses. After a few months, they realized the amount of their debt and began to experience many of the symptoms 
or con un of uncontrollable and unmanageable debt. Going back to that slide in the beginning, they get to go from self-esteem dropping to the pity pot, anger, insanity, and nonsense. So think about that, that slide I showed at the beginning. When making monthly debt payments, in addition to regular living expenses, puts you into the red each month, your debt using habits have become problematic and you may be heading for a financial crash quickly. And I'm telling you, the reason why I wrote that first book, I was there because I was doing loans, the no doc loans with those armed mortgages. And when they turned up, I didn't sell some of the property. So I found myself in the red and it was a rough battle. And I said, I'm never going back. So now I'm, I'm credit worthy and I do a lot of things. That's almost 14 years ago. So I'm putting this in place for people that's going through experiences now. And I want to make sure I can help you. Exercise 2.2, financial tip. What percentages of adult Americans have a credit card? How old were you when you first obtained a credit card and how did you become aware that you could get one? Do you have a parent, sibling, or friend that has a credit card and how did they obtain one? Give an example of the last time you noticed a retail store giving instant credit to increase impulsive spending. And when I, I want to go into that example. There are stores that say, hey, you can get 20% off if you apply for a credit card. And that's what that word I'm talking about, inquiry. A lot of times people got too many inquiries and that lowers your credit score. If you got more than three inquiries a year, that means you look desperate. You're like you're trying to apply for too much credit. Give me an example when you made the wrong decision with play now, pay later. I could tell you, example, going on vacations with credit, going out to eat with credit, buying Christmas gifts with credit. Give an example of a time when you chose a bad or problematic reason for acquiring debt. A new car with, a, with bad credit. When your interest rate is over 10% on a used car. Evaluating spent your spending habits. Lesson number three. In this last chapter, we learned about functions of credit and how it can be beneficial to consumers, lenders, retailers, and manufacturers. We also looked at some of the most common reasons why people go into debt, including some typical good, bad, and sensible reasons for using credit. In this chapter, our focus will be to evaluate your own spending habits and financial situation. Evaluating your own spindle habits. If you are like most people, it may seem hard to track just exactly where all, all your, your money was, goes every month. Most can account for rent, mortgage, car payments, insurance, utility bills, groceries, credit card payments. However, for most people, the only accounts for 60 to 7% of your income. So where does all the rest of the money go? Well, let's take a look at tracking your money and expenses every month. This will give you an idea of your spending habits and you, and it will allow you to discover where change may be possible. Many people may be afraid of looking where their money goes. Others might find it to be a tedious endeavor. The fact remains that knowing how you spend your money is critical to financial success. Examining your spending habits will, will allow you to change them, spending less and begin to invest the difference. Tracking your spending habits. Okay. For most people, tracking your monthly and yearly income is a simple procedure. The process simply involves gathering pay stubs, bank or deposits or business receipts. It is also important to include any income that is generated through profitable hobbies and side jobs. On the sheet included in this workbook, write down your total income after taxes and spaces provided for the last completed month. For example, if today's date is February 7th, gather all the income sources for the month of February and track all your expenses during that month. Your expense, tracking your weekly and monthly income is easy for most people. 
Now let's try and recall all your expenses over the last past month. To begin, gather all the last month expenses, including your mortgage or rent, car payments, utility bills, credit card installments, checking account statement, and any grocery or department store receipts. Many people do not keep receipts for gasoline expenses. In this case, estimate a total of gasoline purchases will be suffice. Be sure to include any daily or weekly snack expenses in your estimate. All right. So this is a procedure that I do for myself. I, I, I will read it, but I'm going to share with you how I actually do it. I lay out everything they said, and I have direct deposits come in my accounts. So what I would do is every week I sit down. Well, first I sit down and write out all my bills for the whole month because I got to the point where I know what they are. Um, rent or mortgage, cell phone, uh, credit card bill, cell phone bill. Um, investment accounts. I pay them like a bill. My tithes and offerings, investment. I lay all those out. And as I lay them out, I try to pay all of them. Sometimes with one paycheck for the month. And I might get into the second one. But when all my bills are paid, it's a great feeling. And it makes me feel sufficient as a person. And going back to that model I have in the beginning of each lesson, my self-esteem rises just because of that actual concept of I know that I paid all my bills, I invested, I gave to charity, and I paid myself for the future. And as those investment accounts are increasing, or my end of the year tax statement says such and such, or my student loan payment say, you made a payment on as agreed for 12 months or 76 months, and you're qualifying for forgiveness, you only got 36 months left. Those are things that I put in place through actually doing this process of my income. What, telling my money where to go and where, where telling them where to go and how I'm going to spend it. And when I want to have some fun, I have money for fun. When I want to eat out with my wife, I have the funds to do that. If a, if a $500 emergency comes up, I got the money to do it because I planned the month out and I tried to pay all the bills on time. And it doesn't even take all the paycheck. It probably takes 40 to 50 percent of my income. So let's go off. Let's, let's, I'm going to read this and we're going to share this concept with you for you to understand and make it simple for you. Starting with the first day of the month, begin to list every purchase expense that you can account for. To simplify this task, use the worksheet and begin by listing all the mortgage, rent, car payments, insurance, utility bills, and any credit card payments. For many, these may be the only expenses that can be recorded accurately. Continue by listing daily and weekly expenses that you can accurately include parking expenses, gas expenses, snack expenses, and grocery expenses. Although you may not have an accurate log of these expenses, you probably have a good handle on your weekly average. Next, list all the, any expenses in the previous month for medical, clothing, and any gifts you may have purchased. Finally, list any additional Miscellaneous expenses from the prior month that do not fit into any of the above categories. When all expenses that you can account for have been listed, the next step involves adding all expenses and comparing them to your monthly income. For many people, this is a rough estimate of income and expenses. It's all you need to see, to clearly see that you are spending more money each month than is coming in. You're probably already new to this. Knew this. You probably know this. And others, for others, the picture might not be so clear. Many of you may discover that only 60 or 70% of your monthly income can be accounted for. So what happened to the rest of the money? Many of you may be shocked to realize that you cannot account for a large portion of your income, monthly income. I'll say this. Like, oh, what does that mean? I don't even know where all that money went. Well, I spent this much this weekend. I just be running through money. I don't even know where it goes. So you're getting to the point, you're getting to that paradigm again, where you're, devo you're developing habits and you're developing a mindset that find yourself in pain because you're in the negative in your money. And I look at money as a seed. That's why I got the, that's why I'm cutting the money up because it's a seed. I should be knowing where to go when I cut it up and when I'm storing it and when I'm placing it somewhere. I should be intentional about listening to my money, telling it where to go. It should be like eating, sleeping, and drinking. 
I know how to go to the restroom. I know how to make a sandwich. My money should be in that category every time. And I'm not saying I'm not a millionaire yet, but the mindset, you have to be able to tell your money where to go. You got to be faithful over a few, over that small amount first. Then the increases come when you can manage a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, and start saving and giving to charity and investing in your future and having insurances. That's where good credit starts at. So here's the breakdown of tracking the cause of your debt. So tracking the reasons for you or your existing debt will allow you to take control and eliminate needless debt in the future. In this section, we'll examine the reasons for your existing debt. All right. So this 3.2, gather all your monthly loan and credit card statements. So the last time we got all our bills and locate the existing balance, write each credit card or loan balance down on the following worksheet. Next, try and recall and list all the purchases that lead to each balance. After listing the purchases or charges that lead to each balance, after you want to make sure you have the credit card balances and attempt to list the reasons for those purchases or charges. From this exercise, you may have noticed that much of your debt has spent was spent on purchases that may have not been essential. Others may realize others may realize that much of the debt cannot be accounted for. That's that phrase I'm talking about when I say, "Oh, you know where the money went? I spent this much money, man. My account about to overdraft. I ain't even know I did." So that means you're not telling your money what to do. Tracking the causes of your debt, continue. Tracking the reasons for existing debt will allow you to take control and eliminate needless debt in the future. In this section, we'll examine the reasons for your existing debt. Gather all your monthly and credit card statements and balances. And this is how we list the purchases. So how do we get in such debt? The impulsivity factor. If you could not account for much of last month's spending or for much of the balance on your credit cards, you are not alone. In fact, for most people, problematic debt is not built from purchasing essential items. It is usually built from consumers buying impulsively. Impulsive shopping includes unnecessary purchases made on the spur of the moment. These purchases are often rationalized with common excuses, including, I got a great deal on this. Oh, man, that's... That, that phrase right there, a kill your budget, right there. I have always wanted one. That's trying to live a childhood fantasy, y'all. Like with those sneakers, people buy a lot of sneakers and they don't wear them. And I'll just pay for it. I'll just pay it off next month. Man, that's, well, I go through the pain and hurt of it. Many people like to shop as a social activity. People go shopping when it is cold and raining or when they have an afternoon to fill. In fact, indoor shopping centers were created for that specific purpose. While we are in the mall, different items may catch your eyes, our eyes, and we impulsively purchase things that we should never buy if we had to pay for cash for them. The credit card has helped us make all of this possible. Successful salespeople understand that consumers make many leanness, needless purchases impulsively. Have you ever heard of this phrase? What would it take for you to take this home today? Or if you purchase this item today, we'll give it to you for an additional savings of 30%. Many sales managers are willing to lower, bargain, and bring down prices of major purchases as an incentive for the customer to purchase the item immediately. They understand the power of impulsive buying and realize if the customer leaves the store, they are, they are likely to decide not to make the purchase. So like when you buy a car, you go in to get a vehicle, uh, you see some jewelry you want, and you go in, they say, oh, we have a Thanksgiving sale. We have a Christmas sale. Get an extra 30% off. Buy this credit card application. Or, hey, what does it take for you to leave with this? I can give you two of them for this price. Go ahead. Your girl really like this. Those phrases get people captured into the word impulsivity. How bad is impulsive shopping? 
Impulsive shopping accounts for half of the retail purchases made in America today. Likewise, because shopping is done on the spur of the moment, few people compare their purchase for quality and price. Not surprisingly, we end up spending about three times more money than we had planned to spend on any given shopping trip. Because it is so easy to shop impulsively, when one does not have to pay for purchases with cash, building substantial debt can happen quickly. Exercise 3.3. What was your experience with this exercise, with these exercises, and what did you learn about your personal spending habits? Give an example when you were an impulse shopper and did not comp compare quality or price. Did you ever see the same item somewhere for less? Did you find that you did not use that item and it's just collecting dust? The greatest time I see that experience happen is during the holiday. And when families go out and say, my kids gonna have a good Christmas. That's connected to the paradigm shift that I shared earlier, that pain and change. Sometimes people spend money because they had traumatic experience from their childhood and they say, my, I grew up without nothing. I'm going to make sure my kids going to have everything. Your kids don't want everything. So I'm giving this holiday example because a lot of us do it. We use the season for the wrong reasons and we find ourselves impulse shopping and buying just to say, I got this or I have this or I achieved this level because I got this tangible object. Success is not what you have, it's what you do with it to accumulate more, to have access to more opportunities for yourself, your family, and your community. Number, lesson number four, is my debt out of control? That's the question, that's the underlining question to you. Is your debt out of control? That's a question we're going to ask you. After completing the exercise in Chapter 3, you probably have a better understanding of your personal spending and debt spending habits. Many of you may be very uncomfortable with your current spending and debt purchasing habits and realize you might have a problem. In this next chapter, we will describe some of the most common warning signs of problematic debt. We also have included worksheets and activities and exercises to assist you in determining how much of a problem your debt has be, may have become. Here's a question again. Is my personal debt out of control? It's not difficult for anyone to realize that they are in debt. However, the following scenarios describe the typical symptoms of individuals who experience problematic debt. So basically, I'm going to tell you this. You are not in this alone. A lot of times people look at credit as if they got it by themselves. They the only one got the problem. You are a consumer. The whole economic system is set up to have debt. Everybody going to have some debt in their lifetime, but it's the mindset on how you approach it. I want to be the lender instead of the borrower. So I'm going to go without having certain things financed so I can have capital in my pocket. So we just got to change our thinking. Is my personal debt out of control? Does your financial institution represent any of the following? You reach your cash advance limit on one or of your credit cards to make monthly payments on another credit card. You hold many credit cards and you use the excuse that they all have different interest rates, so it's important to keep them. You keep your checking account unbalanced so that you truly never know the extent of the damage. You start to realize that there is more month left at the end of the month. You just fast forward into the next month and float those checks. You previously paid cash for most items, primarily the impulsive items, and now cannot afford to have them. But you still do not stop the purchasing madness. You continue to pay to only the minimums and at least feel that you are paying your bills. 
you are post-dating checks. You apply for new loans before the old ones are paid off. You have trouble making your house payment. You have put off all the maintenance activities from visiting your dentist to painting your house because you can't afford it right now. Any of these situations are familiar to you? You may be one of the millions of people that have a prop debt problem. I pay my bills on time, so how could I have a problem with debt? That's a question you need to ask yourself. That sounds like a legitimate argument. You are paying all your bills and making monthly expenses on time. However, there is not enough at the end of the month for any type of savings program. Some people may call this living paycheck to paycheck. Suppose for a moment that an unexpected emergency emergencies arise. You need $2,000 to replace a furnace, a furnace in your home. Can you get a loan? With additional loan expenses cause, cause you to spend more than, than you earn every month. What could you do if you, if you suddenly went into work to find out that your company was closing in exactly two weeks? If you had a problem with debt, this could lead to a devastating financial disaster. Most financial experts believe that consumers who are spending more than 20% of their after-tax income on non-mortgage debt are, de are dangerously overburdened. To find out what your debt ratio is, you need to add up all your monthly non-mortgage loan and credit card payments and then divide them by the total of your monthly net income. If your debt is above 20%, you will need to take immediate action to reduce your debt. Let's look at an example. All right, it's me. It's an old one that I had a long time ago. Chauncey earns $2,500 a month after taxes. He has a car loan for $400. And he owes $6,000 credit card companies on which he must pay a minimum of $500 per month. Add $400 and $500, this monthly debt is 36% of his monthly income. This places Chauncey in a dangerous high debt level. With the addition of $1,000 monthly housing bills, Chauncey is above 75% fixed monthly expenditures. He will probably will need to go to what do I do now? Diabetes. This was my situation before I wrote the book, before I put a plan in, in the place of my life. So I'm just sharing this with you because I can't be the, be the answer for you if I haven't been in the actual solution. So I had to, I had to look at my own expenses before I was able to produce a course or a class and say, this really worked for me. So I actually do this for people and it's, I've changed a lot of lives and it, it really helps. List all your auto loans, school loans, personal loans, and credit cards. Do not enter your mortgage or rent. Determine your monthly um, payment for each account. Add up all the payments. Divide the monthly take-home pay into your average monthly debt. This answer will be your percentage of debt. If you have determined that you have a severe problem with debt, don't panic. The first step in solving a problem is always your ability to admit that you have a problem rather than letting the debt to continue to control your life. You will be taking the first steps to controlling your debt. Using the next chart, compare your debt rate to determine the severity of your debt problem. Debt ratio chart. Here's a breakdown of it. 10%, you're probably a good credit manager. 15%, no cause or alarm at this time, but you should evaluate your spending and attempt to bring it closer to 10%. You have a debt problem if you're at 20% and should immediately begin working to reduce your debt. 25% or above, extremely problematic debt. You may be in jeopardy of losing your home or automobile. You need to seek what do I do now This is at my actual website. I remember being at 36 plus. It was a hard time after the mortgage meltdown. If I was, I had income, but it was going all the debt, credit card debt, housing debt, properties that I own because of the arm mortgage just changed. It's like then I lost my job. It was, it was just a, like a whirlwind of debt. So when I got it balanced, it's 10 percent now. I'm like, oh, that's that's easy. I pay that little bill, that bill. And I, I love looking at the the credit card debt that I do, do have. It's zero. I just, I do credit like it's supposed to be done. If I can't pay for it five times, 
I'm not buying it. I'm going to say it again. If I can't pay for a miscellaneous item five times, I'm not buying it. So you, know, so you think about your income. And you're like, well, if I can buy that five times, I can get it. That's the mindset. If you have determined that you have a severe problem with debt and don't panic, the first step in solving the problem is always your ability to admit that you have a problem rather than letting the debt to con letting the debt to continue to control your life you will be taking the first steps to controlling your debt and that's what I want you to do that little lesson will show you that finding a debt ratio exercise is your debt rate what you expected or were you surprised with the results so this is after you do the lesson I told you mine was 36 and this I was depressed I was sad. It was hard. And I was married, too, and it was a rough situation for me. So going back, I'm, I'm not saying I'm glad it happened, but I learned a lot. And I said, I'm not going back to that experience. If I can control my money to avoid that, I will. Lesson number five. This is, this is a, a great lesson. It's uh, goal setting, prioritizing, and organizing. It's all about telling your money where to go and getting things in place to make sure they're doing right. How important is a debt-free lifestyle? Goal setting, prioritizing, and organizing. Is my personal debt out of control? Before we take the steps towards permanent change, we must decide, first decide, what, is, what it is we want to accomplish or what goals and objectives are. In this lesson, our focus will be to determining your financial values and goals and deciding the steps necessary to achieve those goals we must also take the time to truly understand why are they so important to us. Secondly, in this lesson, we hope to assist you in organizing and maintaining your financial records on your way to financial success. If living a debt-free life is one of your values, then we, then we can state measurable goals, objectives, or steps necessary to bring our lives in line with our value. The higher the priority of the value, the more satisfaction we will acquire through accomplishing goals or objectives that are in line with those values. Therefore, the first step to financial management is determine how much of a priority living a debt-free life is to you. It's a priority to me. I've made it a business. It feels good not to have a car payment. It feels good to look at a credit card and it say zero balance. It feels good to have my student loans in the forgiveness program. Where I only got 36 months left and it's only one loan. It feels good to be able to look in the bank and have surplus. It feels good to go through all your bills and be, have it paid. But it starts with the seed that you place. And like I said, I talk about different areas of being debt free. The first thing is, and I'm a spiritual person first, you got to put God first. Because if you don't put God first, the next portion comes. If you put God last, kill, steal, and destroy, you'll be first in your life. Every time you get some money, it'll be it'll disappear. It'll, your dreams will be killed. Your ideals will be killed. You'll always find yourself in spiraling debt and trying to find things to replace your self-esteem. So you got to find your financial debt-free lifestyle in a spiritual realm where you say, I'm going to take 10% of my money and put it in charity, in my church, somewhere, because it shows obedience in your mindset. So I don't mean to get off on a different tangent, but when your goal said, you got to learn how to set aside and be obedient with your money first. It's another lesson, lesson 5.1 of goal setting, prioritizing, and organizing. In order to be successful, you must first put in writing all of the reasons why this value is important to you. In this section, please write down all the reasons why living a debt-free life is essential to your happiness. I'm going to let you do that because I got my own reasons. I don't want to actually do the lesson for you because everybody got different reasons why they want to be debt free. I can give you one and it's probably if you're in a relationship, money is a love language. So if one, if one person is a bad spender, one person is not, it's going to be a problem for both of you. So money is a love language. In a relationship. I'm gonna give, that's the one I'm going to give you. 
Now that you have a better understanding of why it's essential that you live a debt-free life, let's begin to write some goals and objectives to help you achieve this, this value. Keep in mind the following guidelines to assist you in defining and accomplishing your goals. Keys to goal setting, you got that key to success at the bottom too. Goal setting is a very powerful technique that can yield some strong returns in all of areas of your life. It allows you to choose where you want to go in life because it requires you to choose to focus on and adjust your course while striving towards your target. Goal setting gives you long-term vision and short-term motivation. It forces you to focus your time and it helps you to organize your resources. Through setting goals, you can expect to achieve more, improve your skills and performance, increase motivation to achieve, increase your pride and satisfaction in your achievements, improve your self-esteem, eliminate barriers that hold you back, set in your financial goals effectively. The way in which you set goals has everything to do with the likelihood in achieving them. The following guidelines will ensure that you begin correctly. The key to success. The bullseye of it. The way in which you set goals has everything to do with your likelihood in achieving them. The following guidelines will ensure that you begin correctly. Positive statement. Express your goal positively. Creating an effective spending plan is much more effective than staying on a tight budget. Be precise and accountable because see, sometimes budget sound like a bad word. So if you say, I got this effective spending plan that I do, I get some mad money, 10% of my check and I get to have fun with it. I pay myself for my investments and insurance and I pay all my bills and I pay into charity. So if you set a precise goal, putting in dates, times and amounts that, a, that achievement can be measured when you have achieved it, reward yourself. Man, I'm not talking about go buy something. Go celebrate. You can celebrate with an exercise, a walk in the park, um, a simple self-care, getting your hair done, your nails, something that's that, that you can afford to say, okay, I spent $20 there, $30 there. Just a, a cheap thrill. Setting financial goals effectively continued. Write goals down. Write your goals down. Keep a journal. Always keep a journal. In order to avoid confusion and give your financial goals force, write them down and refer back to them when needed. Keep operational goals small. See, learn, learn to work slow to work fast. Because you, you make a small goal and you attain it, you're like, I attained 10 small goals. So when that big goal comes, you're like, I know how to do 10 small things towards the big goal. Keep goals you are working towards immediately small and achievable. If a goal is too large, then keep it, it can be seen that you are not making progress towards it. Keeping goals small and incre incremental gives more opportunities for reward. Organizing. That's one of my favorite parts. This, is, this helped me out a lot. In, in, this, in the preceding section, you learned about the importance of determining and focus on financial goals. In this section, you will learn about organizing and maintaining financial records. To remain on the road to financial success, one must always maintain the ability to view a snapshot of their current financial picture on any given day. This can only be accomplished through maintaining accurate and up-to-date records or their financial situation. On the other hand, financially successful people keep records of their entire financial picture. Likewise, to eliminate debt and achieve your financial goals, you must be constantly aware of your financial snapshot and willing to change course if and when your financial situation changes. Creating, creating your sp personal spending management system, reasons for keeping good record systems. One, it allows you to track your progress for each financial goal. Two, you will always have financial information available to complete financial applications and statements. Three, always, it, it always allows you to prove documentation for IRS and tax purposes. And four, proof of payments to creditors and lenders. All of these four are great. We'll start with number four. When my clients are working with me, I tell them to keep all their receipts, all their letters, because a lot of times it turns into no payment to certain creditors and lenders because you got proof 
that the statute of limitations ended. Number three, to the IRS, keeping those tax records and having an accountant is viable to your financial, financial sanity. I can remember a situation in my life where I was working in real estate and I had a $15,000 tax bill, but I had an accountant. And he showed me that I didn't owe the $15,000 tax bill. When he got done, he had all my financial records. I was paying him for over several years. I ended up getting a refund in that situation back in 2006 that, when that happened. So, two, the financial information available to complete financial applications and statements. Those PPA loans, those SBA loans, those EDIL grants, I was able to get several of those because I had my financial records in order. Number one, it allows you to track your progress towards your financial goals. When you're saving up for retirement or you're saving up for insurance or an investment or you're trying to make a move financially to do some things, you're able to keep track of those records. And now everything is electronic, so you can go in and have an app that does it for you. And you can set a, a separate bank account aside and build towards organizing that. My favorite, man, this thing right here changed my life. The file cabinet. The first step in organizing your financial records is locating a permanent area in your home or office used as a work area and a permanent storage area. That's first thing. You, it's not a drawer in your kitchen where the forks and spoons and the edge of ketchup packages are at. Two, purchase or locate file folders to be used as document storage. Now, you don't have to have a file cabinet like me, like this one. I have that. I started off with file folders and I had them labeled what they were with the years and I put them in a box and I kept them in my office, and then I had a storage area for them. So you can get to the point of purchasing a file cabinet. I, I got a file cabinet in a safe. I believe that transcripts and certain documents need to be in an area where I can get to them. Uh, setting up a filing system, setting up a filing system for bills, statements, contracts, and receipts. Two, keep recent, older, one-year older documents in different drawers of your filing cabinet. Three, decide on sorting or grouping your filing system Sort and label all financial and personal area with your filing system. The following list contains some of the suggested categories that may be appropriate. A, bank and checking account by bank, including statements. Uh, B, credit card statements, correspondence, and monthly purchase records. C, credit bureau reports and updates. D, creditors. E, employment records and benefit information. F, health insurance, medical bills, doctor, and hospital information. And I that's I like that one because I just had a hospital bill that I had. I'm like, I don't owe that. And I had proof in my file cabinet that I don't owe it. Uh, G, home or rental agreements, those contracts you get for leases and mortgages and documentation and blueprints. Uh, car information, insurance, titles, et cetera. You keep some in your file cabinet. You keep a copy in your car. Educational information, including diplomas, certificates. Uh, transcripts, because some people have certifications that they have to get certified. So when you go off to these trainings, you can have the documentation printed and you can have it scanned in a, a Google file or email folder. How long you keep these records? One, receipts for food and clothing. Two, utility bills. Three, receipts for deductible items. Four, insurance policies with no outstanding claim. Five, Cancel checks for reductible items, deductible items, tax deductible items, things to keep for seven years, all income tax records. I, I still got my income tax records from 2002. I just keep everything. I, I keep them in a vanilla folder. I had the same account since 1999. So that's what I do. Uh, two, supporting all documents for tax records. Three, cancel checks for tax deductible expenses. Okay, you have reached the end of volume one, debt. By this point, you should have a clear picture of the functions of credit and debt. You have also learned about good and bad reasons for using debt, including an understanding of your own spending and debt habits. Additionally, you should have some clear financial goals written out along with effective personal records and management, um, um, management system. At this point, you should be ready to begin the process of living debt free, a debt-free life. In the next volume, our focus switches to specific techniques and strategies for eliminating personal debt on your way to financial success.
I'm Chauncey Williams. This is what do I do now biz. And we are here to build the face of your financial future. And that was volume one. I enjoyed your time hanging out here with me today. Um, I've been through some of these pain situations and trenches, but I enjoyed you listening to me and tapping into the lessons. I can't wait to have you on volume two. Have a good and blessed day. May all your money come to you like eating, sleeping, and drinking. Thank you.